Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you for inviting me to do this. Uh, so we're going to split this section up into a couple of uh, sections. I'm going to talk about outsourced uh, beam modulators and outsourced physics work. Uh, how do we do quality assurance or review of those types of processes or materials? And uh, Dr. Kujaker is going to talk about uh, brachytherapy and I forgot what else you're talking about, Rajan, but whatever. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. Um, I want to say that Kyle was the first person who, he was supposed to do this talk, but he outsourced it and he gave it to us. And I still have, you, you still owe my 10 bucks, by the way. I still, I need that money whenever, if you give it to me after the meeting, that'll be good. All right, so. So, uh, this is a brief outline. We'll start off with quality assurance for outside physics services, the range of services which, which you would expect to have some type of verification internally, and then look at uh, peer review recommendations because there's a lot in uh, the APM recommendations in Task Group 2, 103, and we'll talk about that. And then we'll talk about beam modulators, photon-based compensators, and electron bolus therapy, and then we'll make some conclusions. So what are some types of physics services that you might want to, we might be considering for quality assurance for these? Well, some examples for, we've all had uh, or we've all known of or perhaps participated in uh, the acceptance or commissioning of a new medical device, a LINAC or an HDR unit, or perhaps some procedure. Maybe you're going to develop a special procedure in your clinic. You'd like to have someone else who has more expertise on that come in and help you out, or you have that expertise, you'd like to provide that service for someone else. So that's a good example, a primary one, in, certainly in radiation oncology. Uh, providing temporary coverage for clinical physics uh, for a particular department, someone's going to be out, and you're going to come in and provide physics services. Uh, or perhaps outside consultants to aid with uh, some type of specialty, specialty which you don't have. For example, equipment selection. At my previous institution, we did a long search to discuss the uh, uh, purchase and acquisition of uh, Proton uh, <coughs> Therapy Center, which we ultimately didn't do. But we engaged outside consultants to come in and aid with us who had expertise in areas we didn't have. So what are some preliminary issues that you need to consider when you're going to uh, engage outside physics services? Well, first you want to make sure that uh, where, where it's warranted that you're going to have services provided by a qualified medical physicist, in particular if you're doing anything that's clinical that's going to affect patient treatments. Uh, you'll need to know your hospital and outpatient facility credentialing guidelines. It may be that the person who's coming in may need to be credentialed by that facility if necessary. For, if they have credentialing for medical physicists, that's important. I've been at uh, my last three institutions. One has not required any credentialing. One required physicists to be credentialed as Allied Health, and one put physicists on the medical staff. So, and each of those may have different requirements as far as how you engage uh, temporary or outside services to come in and assist. Um, you need to be specific in your contract agreement with an outside consultant. If you're want, wanting someone to come in and uh, commission your LINAC, you don't want to just say, hey, I need you to come commission my LINAC. You may need what, exactly what it is that you want. I want you to gather all the data. I want you to provide the data on and this and this format. I want to uh, see, have a final written report. I want you to have agreement within the Van Dyke criteria, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Everything that you want, you need to make sure is within the agreement that you make with that person. And you obviously, you need to keep administrative personnel abreast of the selection negotiation process so that they're all on the same page. What should I verify? Um, well, <laughs> who, what should I verify from an outside physics service? Well, as pointed out, there's not a lot of literature, but many, many of you probably aren't uh, familiar with the uh, recent Tasker report on quality assurance of outside physics services. Uh, can I get a show of hands of those of you who are familiar, or at least have heard of this task group report? Any of you? Well, that's a good thing because that's fake news, it's, as Trump's been <laughs> talking about. Um, but so what, what should I verify? Well, certainly you need to do some independent verification. It's warranted in most circumstances. Uh, there is no, obviously, report from the AAPM that's out on this, although this is sort of an important area that needs, that needs discussion. But we're going to need some type of independent verification, but you don't want to verify every piece of data that's provided by someone else if they're commissioning a LINAC. You don't want to go and remeasure all the wedge factors and make sure that it's okay, for example. So some type of reasonable verification might be similar to what you would expect when you have an outside peer review uh, to come look at your practice within internal medicine. So uh, this seems to be one of the more relevant AAPM documents for recommendations, which I thought would be important to discuss today. 
And so there is an APM tasker report on peer review. This isn't fake. It was established by the, uh, the professional council's picker committee and is charged with gathering information on uh, existing peer review processes, for example, the RPC, uh, their uh, physics audit or ACRO and ACR's uh, uh, practice accreditation standards uh, guidelines. They are to formulate a framework for peer review between two clinical radiation oncology physicists and have a suggested format for written report summarizing the review. Um, <clears throat> and in the report, they point out that, in fact, 29% of clinical physicists are the only physicists in their department I, uh, from a 2002 survey, which I find remarkable. That was one of the more surprising facts that I found from this survey, and a fact that you probably want to keep in mind when you're doing the online evaluation and answering Sam's questions. Um, <clears throat> the task group 11 on the solo practice of medical physics and radiation oncology recommends that there be an annual peer review by quality management, quali qualified medical physicists. And our physician colleagues are also big, big believers in long-term promoters of peer review. It's specified in the the ABMS's maintenance of certification program that one of their standards includes evaluation, evidence of evaluation or performance, uh, and they support peer review, a, the ACR, ABR supports peer review as a method of satisfying this MOC component. So just in a quick summary of the TG103's uh, 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 findings, uh, they suggest that for at least for uh, solo practitioners, you should have an annual review and it after, or at least once every three years. This should inc uh, include an on-site review and an exit interview. Uh, there should be some sort of written report which uh, describes uh, what things could be done to improve things at your facility. And the peer review process they emphasize is not to be adversarial. This is a me mechanism by which you can improve the physics coverage, the physics services at your facility. So here are some components that they say are important in a peer review. First, Linux output calibration should be within 5%. Uh, you could do a quick, they can do a quick check of that. Uh, and the 5% is sort of the RPC criterion when they do external TLDs. And that should be reasonably, uh, should be obtainable. Uh, they should do a chart audit for at least five independent charts. Make sure the dosimetry is second check before first treatment, the weekly physics chart checks, et cetera. They should review the facility's quality assurance program to make sure that it follows standard guidelines such as TG40 or TG142. Uh, physics program documentation, make sure the policy and procedures are in place, in particular for a solo practice. Uh, you want to make sure that if there's some unplanned extended absence for a solo practitioner, uh, that there is documentation that another physicist could come in and understand this and be able to reproduce the physics work that was taking place at that facility. Uh, any uh, relevant federal state guidelines are met, of course. Uh, Physics professional development records are in place, that they're continuing to, to uh, follow through on their maintenance of certification, CMEs, et cetera. Arrangements for physics coverage, if the physicist is out, if somebody's out, somebody's going to be in the center. Uh, On-site coverage is sufficient, although it's clear within this report they are not tasked or charged with uh, determining appropriate staffing levels. There are other documents out there that tell you what the staffing levels are, and, the, and if you're doing a review, you can refer to those. Uh, vendor service agreements are in place. And finally, a review of the last peer review report. Make sure that uh, the recommendations that were given in the last report have been uh, carried out by the facility or reasons why they haven't. There's a number of checklists in the report which are very useful if you're going to perform a peer review. Uh, these are some, there are five of them in particular. This is one example, one from physics instrumentation, just to look and see have these been calibrated in an appropriate period of time by the ADCL, um, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, they uh, refer to end-to-end -to -end tests. So they give an example uh, diagram here of, uh, of how you might do one, and this would be a, um, an independent dosimetry check. Uh, where you measure the dose off axis and uh, plan this dose, uh, deliver the dose, and make sure you have agreement within, say, 3% for an ion chamber seems reasonable. Uh, so they suggest that a reviewer would do that type of approach, do that when they do this review. So the question is, what TG103 recommendations are appropriate if I need for quality assurance for outside physics service? Well, I think, first of all, it's certainly appropriate to have an exit interview and a review of a written report with a consultant. If you have someone 
coming in and commissioning a, a medical device for you, uh, you would like to review their written report, make sure that it contains, um, that it's complete, that all of the data is in there as necessary, and it contains any written procedures for how to perform things that are necessary, any limitations of the device that they found or any concerns that they have with the device, and have an exit interview with the consultant to discuss, go over any of these things or maybe discuss things that you feel like uh, they should, they left out within the report so they can edit it and give you a final copy. You should certainly repeat any important measurements, significant measurements. For example, if you're having someone commission your LINAC, it's reasonable to go and repeat a TG51 calibration yourself to make sure that's okay, or at least oversee that process while this individual is doing that to make sure you get the same results and agree that you're within the right standard, you're, you're, you're within tolerance. End-to-end -to -end test, I think, is a very good example of something that should be done uh, when you're commissioning something, uh, again, with a LINAC as an example. Run a test on your treatment planning system, make sure that you get the same result, measure the same result that your treatment planning system says. And finally, an internal report of an in-house verification I think is very, very worthwhile. So in addition to the documentation that's kept within your clinic that shows that this individual has, has commissioned your LINAC or your treatment planning system, an, an internal report of what verifications you have done and how that you've signed off on the fact that they've signed off on this device is reasonable and make it useful for yourself as well as future people who will work, be operating in the clinic. Okay, so we're going to... Uh, shift gears now and talk about uh, quality assurance for beam modulators and we'll begin by talking about photon compensators and photon compensators have been used for photon or physical compensators have been used for photons for many years they were first suggested by Brahmi in 1988 I believe almost 30 years ago for IMRT and they have a number of advantages for IMRT uh, they have a higher resolution the direction norm perpendicular to MLC leaf travel they have no match line tongue and groove problems there's no interplay effects that is all parts of the field are simultaneously irradiated. You could potentially treat wider fields depending on the compensator material. They're certainly more monitor unit efficient and can be more treatment time efficient depending again on the compensator material and design. And the dose computation is simpler. You don't have to worry about small fields or tongue and groove or dose outside the field, et cetera. There's a number of advantages to doing these. Of course, they're very labor intensive. Uh, and um, as a result, most by, by far, since the, especially since the mid-90s, we've almost exclusively been MLC-based. But they are uh, used in a number of clinics, especially overseas. So let's talk about quality assurance for compensator-based IMRT delivery. Well, uh, a number of reports where you can do just simply a manual check of thickness versus, versus position. You've designed the compensator. It's come in from some uh, external company or external uh, group that have provided you this compensator. What are you going to do to check it? Well, first, just some quick checks to make sure that the thickness of the compensator is correct versus position on the central axis and maybe one off-axis point it would seem a reasonable check. Uh, point dose measurements in phantom have also been discussed by a few, uh, few groups is what they do. In other words, a simple uh, square phantom uh, point dose calculation of, or measurement of what the dose would be at the central axis of the compensator and then measure it and make sure you're within tolerance. In vivo dosimetry was reported by Shaw Chang and company during their early works. Of course, this type of measurement is not unique to compensators. It could be due for MLC-based IMRT as well. Uh, but they measured like 340 patients treated with their MLC, with their, sorry, their physical compensator IMRT program and found that most of those patients, or 97% of those were within 10%. Um, and, and so that was a reasonable check to make sure that the compensators were working okay. And then, of course, the standard copy to phantom technique. That is, take your compensator, um, move, it to a move it to a phantom that's been scanned in, into your treatment planning system, uh, compute it on the, the treatment planning system compared to what you would measure uh, when you apply the compensator in your clinic. Of course, Compensators do affect the beam a little bit differently than MLC based because they do uh, present a significant amount of attenuating material inside the beam and so that that can have some effects on, on your devices. Um, and in fact, this particular paper from Steve Jang et al. when he was in Ohio talked about uh, the design of photon based intensity modulated uh, compensators. And uh, in this case, is, uh, he developed an automated compensator design algorithm and calculated the beam effects using Monte Carlo code, uh, such as what changes in energy, beam hardening, what type of low energy photons you get from scatter, surface dose, et cetera. And then they reported the results for 6 MV photons uh, using uh, uh, Sarabend uh, compensators, uh, which would probably have the most dramatic effect with this high Z materials. 
And what they found is you would expect that as the compensator got thicker, there was a significant hardening of the beam. On the left side is a, is a plot of the, of the spectrum that they, would, they calculated using Monte Carlo uh, versus energy and as you see uh, versus uh, thick to the compensator. For the open field, they had a at mean energy of about 1.8 MeV, and for a five centimeter slab of compensators, they were closer to about 2.7, about a 50% increase in the average energy. Um, but as a result, the percent depth dose didn't change significantly. There's only about a 3% increase in percent depth dose uh, with a five cm slab, which would be fairly extreme for a Cerebin type compensator. Uh, you might expect somewhere around three centimeters at most, but but regardless, uh, there's not a whole significant effect on the percent depth dose. However, if you have detectors that are energy dependent, then that might be an issue. And there have been some controversy, for example, using film dosimetry with compensators, if you're going to use that to do your QA. Uh, for example, this group from the University Hospital in Germany, in Jena, uh, reported that four MCP96 compensators, which is basically like Cerebin, it's another low melting point alloy with a lot of lead and bismuth, uh, that they demonstrated a significant energy dependence discrepancies between the radio radiographic film dosimetry and that that they were measure of non-energy dependent dosimeters. And they'd have differences around 5% between the thin and the thick portions of the compensator um, uh, as a, that, that they, dem they argue as a result of the energy dependence of film, and they recommend using other dosimeters, ion chambers, et cetera, uh, or account for the energy dependence in the analysis. It's a bit controversial. There's this group out of uh, uh, Belgium and Ghent, uh, they uh, also looked at the same compensators of thicknesses up to five centimeters, and they measured depth doses and profiles from both six and 25 MV photons from an electa, and they compared these results uh, between the EDR2 film and diamond detectors, the diamond detector being uh, energy independent, and they concluded that there was a slight film under response from beam hardening, but it was pretty small on the order of one to, to one and a half percent, uh, which is certainly within the overall uncertainty of film dosimetry. This is a plot showing the film under response as a function of uh, compensator thickness for both six and 25, and I apologize, the graph is not, the quality is not so high, but the main thing I want to point out is that the under response level is very, very small. We're only talking about a percent or so, even for thicknesses that are as, as much as 30 centimeters thick. So their conclusion is that compensators are perfect for, are, are perfectly fine, or film is, a, is an adequate dosimeter for a compensator based IMRT. And this is just another example where they did sort of an inverse pyramid type of compensator and compared film and diamond with profiles at a depth of 10. The diamond was measured using a scanning system system in water and the film was in polystyrene in both of them at depth of 10 and they're virtually on top of one another. There's in fact in this case there's the film is actually a little higher uh, where the thickest part of the compensator is. So instead of over, uh, under responding it's actually over responding which they account uh, they account from low energy scattered photons um, sort of counteracting the uh, under response due to the beam hardening. So <clears throat> So now, next step is uh, bolus electron conformal therapy. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this because uh, we, uh, this is a relatively new, new process. Now, there's not a lot of clinics that are going into this, and we were very uh, active at this at Mary Bird Perkins, and we've done a couple at, at Oshner as well. So bolus electron conformal therapy, or bolus ECT technology, is provided by Dot Decimal. It's a free bolus, there's free bolus design software that you can get from them, planning.decimal or p.d which is compatible with most treatment planning systems. And the bolus is fabricated and, uh, at, at dot decimal. Once it's calculated at your facility and designed at your facility, it's fabricated and then mailed to the clinic fairly quickly and at a fairly reasonable cost. And there's been a number of papers that have uh, validated the accuracy of the dose algorithms in both for a number of different uh, electron dose algorithms. The P.D system uses the pencil beam redefinition algorithm, which is a modification of the pencil beam algorithm by Hogstrom, which Pinnacle uses, and then of course Varian has their electron Monte Carlo. All three of these have been used to validate the software. So what, what, is the, what does this software do? Well, basically it's designed so that you can create an electron beam that will provide a 90% isodose service that will hug <coughs> the distal edge of your PTV. So here's sort of a graphical example of a patient with a superfici superficial disease in the head and neck area. And the bolus has been designed here, as you can see the external bolus on, top, on the side of the patient, such that the 90%, which is the purple line in this case, is hugging the distal edge of the PTV. So the two contours that are critical, thank you, Kyle. Two contours that are critical are the, the PTV as well as the external contour, and then everything else is calculated by, um, is, is designed to create this distribution so that it's appropriate. 
It'll decrease dose to normal tissues in that you'll be able to select an energy that will provide 90% just to the distal edge no matter where you are off axis, and it'll reduce dose heterogeneity with irregular patient surfaces. Here's uh, this next few slides sort of just sort of show the process for how this works. So you begin in this case with the pinnacle treatment planning system. You design a, a particular, you have an external contour and you have a PTV that's designed. You export this via DICOM over to the P.D software. Uh, where it, it takes in the, the contours, the external contour, and the PTV. Uh, then the initial bolus design uh, assigns a constant distance, R90, from the bolus surface to the distal surface. So they basically move back from R90 from the edge of your PTV, and that becomes your initial size uh, for the contour, uh, for, the, for the contour for the bolus. Then the, optim the user optimizes the bolus shape, and there's a number of mechanisms for doing that to, to create a satisfactory dose distribution. Now, uh, there's, uh, as I mentioned, the first one mechanism for doing this is a set of operator sequences, or operators, as they're called, uh, in the original work by Dan Lowe and others in 1992. And <coughs> basically, you, you uh, go through these sequences of selecting operators to operate on the bolus to modify it in some way to create a better distribution. There's a creation operator to create the bolus. There's a smoothing operator to smooth out any spikes or uh, things that will cause hot spots within the dose distribution. There's an isodose shift uh, operator and a specified shift if you want to just move it by a fixed amount. So the user can define various sequences of these uh, operators, of these low operators, uh, to create an optimum sequence for creating a bolus design. <coughs> Dot Decimal has also created their own marching algorithm, which is a little bit user, more user friendly. In the marching algorithm, it starts with a flat bolus that's too thick, and they begin to reduce the field size, reduce the thickness of the bolus in, in a, a series of steps until the R90 crosses on each ray line, cross, be, reaches the uh, distal edge of the PTV, and then that particular ray line stops and they move the other parts of the bolus until they've come to an optimal bolus. So both of those techniques work uh, to create the bolus that you want. The final bolus structure is then exported back to the treatment planning system, for example, in this case, Pinnacle, for dose calculation, as you can see here. And then after you've, you're happy with it, you ex electronically transfer it to dot decimal for fabrication, and they mail it back to you. Okay, and there's a number of clinical examples that have been uh, published, and they're listed here. I'm not going to go into great detail, uh, but you can go to the website at dot decimal, and they also have uh, links to all these references. So I want to go through a couple of uh, cases that were done at, at Mary Bird Perkins just to show how these were quality, uh, the quality assurance on these. The basic quality assurance is once that the, the bolus comes back, uh, the bolus is placed on the patient, uh, the patient is rescanned, and then it's recalculated to make sure that the 90% isodose matches what was planned in the optimization uh, uh, process. So in this particular case, the PTV, this is, both of these cases are nose, uh, uh, nose tumors, and uh, the PTV is, is the color-washed blue area, and the isodose here is represent 98% is red and 90 is green, and then we also have a 500 centigrade isodose, which is shown in this sort of teal blue color. And in this particular case, notice that uh, D90 was intentionally not designed to hug the, D, the distal edge, uh, because in order to do that, there are sharp bends in the PTV, and that would cause the compensator itself to have some sharp edges, which would cause hot spots. So we generally try to make this a little bit smoother on the distal edge if it's not necessary to make it so tight, as you can see here. So this is a, a diagram showing the axial view <coughs> of the um, patient treatment with the optimized compensator on and showing the doses that they expect to have with this compensator in place. Once the compensator is created and brought back in, the patient's rescanned and then placed on the surface and then recalculated to make sure that it's okay. Now this particular scan goes through the principal axis of the contour of the compensator, which I can tell because you can see the two BBs. In order to align the compensator, four BBs are placed along the principal axes so that when the compensator is placed on the surface, you can then align the beam to it. In principle, you can remove the BBs before scanning and then place them back, or if you want to, you can scan with this and override the density of the material as well. Um, but in this particular case, if they don't make a lot of difference in the dose distribution, they, 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 they can remain where they are. Um, in this case, the isodoses, again, are 100%, 90%, and again, the 500 centigrade are here is, is shown as well. This is another case of a compensator, but in this particular case, we're treating a region of the nose that's over the eyes and where we're going to place lead uh, shielding in place. 
Um, now, in this, in this case, we're not interested in the dose underneath the lead, so it's not important that we get this dose accurate. However, we do need to have the compensator have space for the lead shields, so they're contoured in prior to the optimization. Then the external contour is wrapped around the lead shields as well, uh, so that the uh, compensator can then come in uh, with spaces for us to place lead shields in place. And as you can see, that's what's shown here. So we have a compensator. In this case, we've put in contours for the, with a density override of one, uh, simply because of in our pinnacle dose algorithm, it doesn't handle anything with density over three currently with the pencil beam algorithm. But again, we're not interested in the dose here. We're really interested in the dose to the PTV, which is between the shields. So that's really just for manufacturing. I do want to, there, there are a number of papers in literature. I will uh, bring up Rajat's paper in 2003 that talked about a couple of patients with uh, one with uh, fibrous histiocytoma of the right ear and one with a uh, Asnic cell carcinoma of the left parotid gland that were treated using bolus ECT. Um, their bolus, however, was not designed using P.D. This was back in 2003. It was an early paper. It was designed using in-house treatment planning system. Patient was rescanned and verified uh, with Pinnacle. And they uh, have their criteria, which are published in this paper, which is the 90% isodose line is within two millimeters of that plan. Okay, so. Uh, this is, and then the dose is within 90%, the dose in the high dose low gradient region, that is within the 90% is within plus or minus 3%. So this is a relatively significant uh, piece of data you also want to keep in mind when you're looking at your SAMS questions. Uh, and this is just a sort of a result showing their in-house software versus the planned agreement and actually it agrees quite well both these patients were treated and very successful. So in conclusions, um, outsourced clinical physics services should be reviewed. You should make sure that their local credentialing and or license requirements are met as necessary. Tasks should be specified as much detailed as possible. And the peer review guidelines of TG103 may serve as a guide for how you uh, review outsourced physics services. Photon compensators can be QA'd as well. They offer many advantages as reported. And they may be verified by either physical inspection along with the same methods as those used for MLC-based IMRT. The energy independent detectors are preferred in these cases, although the magnitude of these effects are, are controversial in the literature. And finally, with a bolus electron conformal therapy, it's a new technique that uses custom milled wax bolus to shape the D90 isodose to cover the PTV. It's been shown to treat a number of superficial sites, and it's verified by rescanning and recalculating the patient with the optimized bolus in place. And I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues at Mary Bird Perkins for providing some of the slides on the electron bolus section. So thank you.